Hi, it's Wednesday, the 7th of April, 2021, and welcome to our first episode of Conversations in Computation Photography, uh, a new series by the Alice Camera team exploring innovations in computational photography, deep learning, uh, and artificial intelligence, and how these can be applied to consumer digital cameras. I'm Vishal Kumar, I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Alice Camera, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, let me introduce you to our CTO and other co-founder, Liam Donovan. He's a PhD electrical engineer who's the chief technical architect and innovator behind the Alice Camera. Hi, Liam. Hello. The second person joining us today is Shelley Srivastava. She is a computational photography engineer who's a graduate in artificial intelligence and has been responsible for the AI elements of our end-to-end -end pipeline. Hi, Shelley. Hello. Okay, so the topic this week is color science, where we will be talking mainly about this term called color constancy, uh, as well as white balance and uh, uh, exposure, and how computational techniques can be applied to correct and balance these parameters. Um, I'd like to sketch out the problem in a bit more detail. So when light hits a camera sensor uh, and an image is produced by the camera, Sometimes digital images often have um, undesired colors due to unusual lighting situations. Um, and so, Liam, the first question kind of is, what is a color cast and why do they exist? Sure. So, yeah, there are, uh, there are lots of different reasons that you can get a color cast in an image. So a color cast is basically when, as Vish said, the light that's hitting the image sensor or, or the, the output of the image sensor um, is not that um, does not have the same kind of color that you expect it to have um, and does not have the same color that you see when you actually look at the image in real life. And there are quite a few different reasons that it can happen. Um, it can happen because uh, different image sensors actually have different uh, color filters and different manufacturing techniques. Um, and this can vary from sensor to sensor um, and from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, and so that can actually cause different color casts. But the, uh, the principal cause of color casts is, is different lighting. Um, so different lighting has actually very different color. Um, and this is not something that we notice really because our eyes and our visual system um, kind of filters that out for us. Um, and we don't, really, we don't really notice the difference in, in color in different lighting situations. But uh, sunlight and incandescent bulbs and fluorescent bulbs all have very different uh, lighting colors. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we don't notice it, but cameras do. Um, and so cameras, as they are at the moment, um, camera technology is not really able to, um, or, well, I should say image sensors don't know the difference. Um, and so image sensors will uh, produce an image with that color cast in, depending on the lighting. Um, and it's actually really important to remove that color cast when you're taking a photograph, when you're producing a photograph, um, because otherwise it just looks wrong. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's an important important aspect of what cameras have to do. So clearly, the uh, you know the exogenous lighting conditions can contaminate uh, the image, or, or at least the way in which the sensor interprets the the image and, and outputs the image. Uh, and is this mainly a flaw of traditional DSLR mirrorless cameras rather than smartphones? Like how how do the two deal with these, 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 this issue of light, light contamination. Yeah, so it's it's something that really affects all cameras, um, but different cameras have different methods for for dealing with it. Um, there are kind of there are a set of techniques that you could call more traditional techniques, which cameras have been using for a while um, to try and remove color casts. Um, uh, but there, there are a bunch of new techniques based on deep learning and artificial intelligence that have been pioneered by the smartphone companies. Um, and these techniques offer a very different approach to the traditional technique, one that is more robust, uh, more reliable in most situations, but which fails in some situations that the old techniques do, um, do succeed in as well. So there are trade-offs. Um, but yeah, with, with Alice, what we're trying to do is basically use the same sorts of techniques that the smartphones do powered by deep learning artificial intelligence, uh, but use them with uh, proper pro sensors and lenses, so. Yeah, great. Uh, before we dive deeper into those um, those techniques, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about like some of the color, um, you know, some of the color defects and color casts that you get uh, 
because of the sensor itself, because of because of the underlying hardware, and also um, the different camera companies. So, for example, if you have a raw image um, or, or or even a processed image taken by a Canon versus a Sony versus a Fujifilm versus a Nikon, they may all have slightly different um, color casts to them. Uh, and from what I understand, that's because, uh, firstly, it could be because of the sensor and uh, the different types of, uh, of sensor, but also it could be uh, because of the way in which uh, the different camera manufacturers uh, demosaic uh, the, the light that, that the sensor processes to, to output the final image. So, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about some of those elements as well. So there are there are quite a few elements which affect this, and the, the first one is or the first the first significant one really is the sensor. Um, so uh, sense, the way that sensors sense color, um, you, you, like an individual pixel can't actually sense color; it just senses light intensity. Um, so in order for a, an image sensor to actually be able to sense color, we have to put color filters on top of the pixels, um, and we take a group of four pixels in, in general, usually you take a group of four pixels and you put a red filter on top of one, you put a blue filter on top of another, and then you put green filters on top of the other two. Um, and this is called the buyer pattern, the buyer sensor, the buyer filter. Um, and by doing this, we can then uh, use a process after we've taken the image using these, this filtered uh, sensor, we can then recombine those uh, individually filtered pixels into a full RGB image using demosaicing. Um, and uh, there are lots of different ways of, of doing demosaicing. It's quite a complicated problem. Um, and different demosaicing uh, algorithms will produce different results and will produce different color casts and different flaws and different successes. Um, but the actual um, color filters that are used can also have a big effect. Um, and different manufacturers use different color filters. Um, and some manufacturers actually use, like, specifically develop their own. Um, color filters to be different from other manufacturers as a differentiation. I think Fuji do this, Fujifilm and Huawei also famously did this in one of their smartphones. They use yellow instead of green um, on their bio filters to produce a different effect. And this produces very quite substantial different image quality and color cast in the final image. Um, but then after the after the sensor, it actually because it's it's all software. So the demosaicing algorithm is a, is a one major um, kind of thing which affects the, the color. But there are a no number of others as well. Um, you can actually break the pr software processing that you have to do on a raw image down into two stages. And the first one is called restoration. Um, and that's really about getting the image as accurate as you can uh, to the scene. So uh, really getting the kind of the, the, the colors as close as they are to reality. Um, and then the next stage is enhancement. And that's actually about tuning the colors to make them more attractive. And that's a much more subjective artistic process. Um, all of the camera manufacturers do both of these tasks and they all do them differently and they all do them in a proprietary way and they don't really tell people how they do it. It's actually a major differentiation between man camera manufacturers and people will say they buy Canon cameras because of the color science and it's a, uh, but, but nobody really, know, nobody outside of Canon really knows exactly what it is that they do to produce their, their individual color profiles and or whatever. And also how much of it is real and how much of it is, uh, is, is people, you know, people thinking they can spot difference when they, when they can't really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a few uh, excellent videos. Uh, one by Tony Northrup who talks about color science and how he, ran a series of tests with uh, about 1,500 people, I think, um, basically pairing uh, images taken by different camera companies and saying, you know, which ones do you prefer than others and um, uh, trying, to uh, trying to reveal some of the biases when it comes to color science. And he describes color science uh, almost like wine tasting. Uh, you know, if you do two, if you have a cheap bottle of wine and a expensive bottle of wine, uh, if you know, if you see the labels, you're, people are mostly going to say, "Oh, you know, the expensive one's better." But if you do a blind test, sometimes you can't necessarily tell. Um, so yeah, color science might actually be more of a social uh, and cultural phenomenon than actually a technical one. But actually, you know, going back to this concept of a Bayer, a Bayer filter, um, so 
what is a quad what's a quad bayer uh filter and um we so alice obviously has a quad bayer filter are there any distinct advantages uh you know in, in if we were to summarize the distinct advantages of a, of a bayer filter versus a quad bayer filter what might they be mm, it's interesting so there are there are it, it's not an absolutely precise term so the exactly what quad bayer filter is quad bayer sensor is and, and what that means is not precisely defined in, in Alice's case instead of having um, uh, instead of having as I described before like one pixel with a red filter on and then another pixel with a green filter on and another one with a blue filter on with Alice um, we actually have four pixels in one group all under one single red filter and then four pixels all under one single green filter and four pixels all under one single blue filter um, and the sensor is actually able to read out those four pixels under one filter in two groups with different exposure times. Um, and so that even though those pixels are actually located under the same under the same filter, they can actually be treated slightly different and they can be uh, they can be read out with different exposure times um, and then recombined later to produce an image that has a higher dynamic range. Um, so right. you can, uh, record half the pixels with a very with a small shutter speed, and then the other half of the pixels with a long shutter speed. Um, capture the shadows in one, and the, the highlights in the other, and then combine it to get an image that has more detail than if it was just captured with one. Um, yeah. uh, but this is a trade off. It's a trade off, and the trade off is a tra is a trade off between um, larger having larger pixels and having more pixels with different exposure time. Um, uh, with larger pixels, you generally get better signal to noise ratio um, uh, in in most situations. But with the quad bias structure, you get you end up with smaller pixels, but you get the kind of split exposure times, which actually produces even more dynamic range. Um, so th there there are trade offs, but it gives you it gives you basically big advantages in dynamic range if you do it right. Right. Yeah, and, and the, I guess the innovation here is that even though the surface area broadly speaking is is the same it's just that the they, they can be read out at, at two different exposures yeah. uh, and obviously knowing this from a from a technical perspective is helpful especially for computational photography engineers like ourselves and our team uh, and trying to use uh, computational methods to um, adjust manipulate and augment uh, the, the color that the, that the sensor is reading. In terms of the demosaicing, you know, we we briefly briefly you you gave like a really good explanation, but you briefly spoke about how uh, camera companies um, try and keep their their demosaicing process uh, or recipe kind of like a secret almost, and they don't really reveal it. What what are we going to be doing for, for, in terms of our demosaicing pipeline, uh, and will we be allowing other people to do their own demosaicing pipeline? Um, uh, you know, giving them control over that at all? Um, yeah, so we are going to give, be giving people much more control over the demosaicing pipeline. Um, we're going to open open source the demosaicing code and, and as much of the imaging pipeline code as we can. Um, so there are a lot of different ways of doing demosaicing as well, and it's just one step as well of the pipeline. There are there are several others, but it is a very important one. Um, but there are lots of different ways of de doing demosaicing, um, and they often have uh, different trade-offs. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are, as well, there are kind of traditional ways and there are new ways. And um, there is quite a lot of evidence that shows that deep learning is um, going to be able to do deep make, demosaicing better than traditional techniques in the future as well. Although this is still one, it's still one area that's quite under quite active research and it's still quite difficult to use deep learning for demosaicing. Um, uh, you can also use image stacking to do demosaicing, de or actually you can use image stacking to skip the demosaicing algorithm completely, um, which is another interesting thing that we're going to be exploring. Um, but uh, for, for example, for video, um, we will be doing kind of traditional single image demosaicing, um, at least to begin with, um, yeah. and at, le at least until deep learning demosaicing effects um, are, are a bit more developed. Um, but yeah, we will be giving people access to that code so they can see what's going on. Um, okay, so let's let's now move away from sensor and the demos and actually start talking more about kind of computational photography and and um, you know some of the work that we're doing, but also some of the work that we're we're planning on doing, as you as you briefly spoke about, Liam. 
Uh, and this is where, you know, we might get Shelley in to talk a little bit about um, the, the main problem that, that I addressed at the beginning, which is that uh, for, um, you know, in situations where there is um, unusual lighting conditions or uh, in situations where the sensor uh, um, uh, hardware um, or the demosaicing process causes a color cast, um, when, you know, most most times uh, with traditional cameras, it's kind of a bit too late to, to do anything about it. Uh, and sometimes people have to, you know, uh, export the raw files into Photoshop and then use um, software afterwards to remove the color cast. Or they, um, or sometimes it's even worse. If you have a JPEG photo, I was just watching this video by Gerald Undone um, about uh, white balance. And he uh, he said that when the J when a JPEG or processed image comes out and it has a color cast, uh, it's actually much more difficult to remove that color cast without affecting a range of other colors. Uh, but what can we do um, at the point of capture using uh, deep learning computational methods to remove that color cast? Shelley? Um, what we'll be doing is uh, using the uh, viewfinder image and it will be going through our network and the network will predict the global illumination color, which will remove it before you take the picture. So that's how our pipeline will work. Right. So the global illumination essentially is the color cast. So it could be uh, really orange in, in illumination. It could be like bluish. Um, and we'll be uh, that the network or, or, or our, our technique understands whether it's, you know, orange or, or, or bluish. Uh, and then once it's found that, 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 what, that illuminance, it then kind of removes it. Is that correct? So what our network will be doing is, depending on the image, it'll figure out which color to remove uh, by what the information image gives us. And it will predict the color, which is basically the global illumination. And we will remove it from the image. And it will be dependent on each image the camera sees. Right. Yeah, were you going to say something on that, Liam? Uh, yeah, so the, 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 most, the most interesting thing about this algorithm that we're using is that it, it learns, so, um, or it is, it is, it's taught, it's trained. Um, so rather than um, us kind of writing code that says, you know, oh, this, this image is outside and it's cloudy, so we should use this particular color balance or this image is done under tungsten lights, we can tell because it's, you know, it's done in a, you can see the fluorescent light or whatever. Um, and so we'll use this kind of color temperature or this global illumination. Um, we actually train the algorithm um, by showing it data. And so we basically show it uh, data of uh, images that are taken by the camera, um, just kind of raw images that are taken by the camera, um, but which are taken with uh, some kind of known uh, kind of color in the scene using, using like a color checker or a gray card or something like that, so that we know what the actual illumination is for sure. Um, so we can then train the algorithm to kind of tell us what the illumination is just by showing it um, the image. Um, and this is actually a better way of doing it than, than traditional methods. It's been shown to be better in, in academic papers. Um, and uh, yeah, it basically is much more robust and it's much more reliable. Um, it will work in more difficult scenes um, and it will work better, uh, basically with less error. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this I think this concept of uh, having a network that understands the illuminance based on what it's been trained uh, to, to to understand uh, is kind of the the fundamentals of machine learning, right? It's it's like the, the core of of machine learning. Uh, and so if you take that um, process, clearly the data is a really important element of that that process alongside the network. Um, and then running inference uh, to be able to correct a new image. Um, so firstly, uh, in terms of the, the network itself, why is a CNN really good at, at doing at tackling this sort of problem compared to a traditional method? Is it is there is there something we can talk about in terms of the CNN itself? So um, the CNN can extract the local features really well, 
and uh, that is uh, the technique which we are depend highly depending on so what the network supposed to learn is it will learn local features as as to areas uh, where the which can provide a lot of information about the color for example if you have a white wall and it has a global like a yellow illumination over it you won't be able to understand if it's the accurate image or not but in case you have an object in front of it uh, whose color you know like an apple then you can act, you can predict which what color it's supposed to be and that's something deep learning uh, can do really well and that's how this technique will be more robust so instead of trying to learn colors from different areas which will which are not giving you enough information you can actually learn from areas which will give you more information and that's what uh, liam said it, it's going to be more robust and will give you more information and you will have a better understanding of what the scene is yes yeah, it's, it's actually a very difficult problem um it's it's it, it doesn't it, it almost doesn't feel like it should be it should be a difficult problem to us because our eyes are able to do it and our brain is able to do it automatically without us thinking about it it's able to distinguish what color the lighting is and what color white should be and we don't we don't even have to think about it it just happens um, but actually to program, um, to, to code up a program that looks at an image and that does that sort of processing that works out what the color should be and changes that color in that way is, is really difficult to do. And it's actually even really difficult to train a neural network to do it. Um, and it's because of what Shelley said, that if, you, if you've got a, a white wall with a yellow illumination, you can't tell that you've got a white wall with a yellow illumination. You, what you could have is a yellow wall with white illumination. There's no, there's no difference between those, um, and so you actually, like, like Shelley said, you need some object, some reference object, whose color you actually know, um, so that you can tell what the, um, what the color cast is, um, and deep learning is able to kind of understand this, um, and the way, the way in which we're training our, our network, it kind of, it specifically learns first how to detect an object which it which it knows should be kind of useful for working out what the color is and then it can look at that object specifically um, and then work out uh, from that object what the color for the whole scene should be um, and this is yeah this this is this is why our this this technique um yeah works really well right yeah so the model looks at a scene and understands <clears throat> this useful object that it that it can use to anchor everything around uh and uh you know, are we talking about this this idea of a confidence map? Is this is this what we're talking about here? Um, what is what is a confidence map? Um, and we've already we've already understood why it's important, but but what is a confidence map? In like kind of sim more simple terms, yeah. So a confidence map will basically give you uh, give you an understanding of which areas of the image is important. So some areas will be less relevant to what you're trying to achieve, and some areas will be will, will be more relevant. So as Liam talked about uh, the like having objects which will give you more information. So in a confidence map, that area should be of high confidence rather than the other uh, areas of the image. And because we are trying to do all of this implicitly, uh, like without detecting that there's this object that there's a tree in front of a wall, so we are trying to do this implicitly that's why we'll need confidence maps so because we are not detecting uh, the object in front of the wall we are just trying to figure out which areas will be more important great maybe we can briefly touch upon uh exposure uh as a branch from this conversation because uh when we are when images are also over exposed or under exposed uh because of um it, difficult lighting conditions, or because of um, uh, you know uh, the sensors' capabilities, we can also apply a sim similar logic, correct, to to adjust um, the exposure as well using this con this idea of a confidence map, uh, and then kind of uh, exposing over. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we use a, a similar structure to do auto exposure. The same um, neural network structure, which predicts which part of the image it should be looking at, um, in order to work out or to best adjust the exposure of the system, and then can work out how to adjust the exposure 
based on uh, its training. Um, so it's a similar structure, and it's a structure that, that works very well for a lot of these photographic manipulations. Um, and it works on very similar principles, and it's it's all about uh, it being a kind of a data led um, a data led problem rather than a kind of a, a human led problem. We actually show the algorithm what we want it to produce, um, and once you've done that enough, it will be able to show you uh, what you want it to produce. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's that's why they work very well. Yeah. Great. Were you gonna? Do you have anything to say on auto exposure, Shelley, versus um, color constancy? So uh, auto exposure, uh, the network which we are using, it's very similar as Liam said, but uh, there are a few uh, changes in the auto exposure network. It has, uh, it basically learns which part of the area, sh which part of the image should be in focus, rather than trying to. Uh, pick out the area which will give us more information uh, about the color. So the, there is a subtle difference between the confidence map of both the networks. And auto exposure is generally uh, looking at which area should be exposed properly. And uh, that's how th uh, the confidence map works for that uh, sort of problem. Great. and. Um... You know, obviously, the success of of these um, algorithms, these these CNNs, which are convolutional neural network algorithms, are dependent on the data. You know, uh, garbage in, garbage out, or good data in, good results out, kind of thing. Uh, and maybe just a couple of points on the data. Liam, I know you 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 spoke about how we are training images, but um, you know, what is our um, approach to to get in the right sorts of data for these algorithms it definitely is much more of a curated approach and we definitely need the right sorts of data uh, for both uh, the color constancy um, algorithm as well as the exposure algorithm hmm. yeah well the data is is extremely important and it's important that you get both good good quality data data that is really relevant data that shows the, the situation that the network is actually going to be used in very precisely um, and which is correct. Um, but the other the other thing that's really important about the data is quantity. You need a lot. Um, you need thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of good quality images labeled correctly um, from the exact same situation. Um, uh, as as it will be deployed in, in 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 real world, if you actually want these algorithms to outperform other techniques, so uh, that is um, where a, bit, a big part of the challenge of these techniques lies. It's in creating these large, accurate, clean data sets, um, and and as as efficiently as you can. Um, and it's quite a challenge. Um, it's a different kind of a challenge to kind of a typical software development. Uh, pro process, um, and it's one that you know it, it, it can be quite fun in, in some ways to actually kind of collect this data because it, you know you basically have to go around taking lots of photographs, um, and as as a photographer, that's you know not the worst uh, kind of thing to be doing uh, for work. So yeah, <laughs> again, because we're taking this kind of semi-open uh, approach, uh, we could definitely envision a future where people can collect their own sets of data or their own uh, data sets and, and retrain or use uh, Alice to uh, improve uh, or fine tune a model to, to their liking, uh, potentially. You know, if, if, uh, if, if, if people want to contribute, um, people have, have spotted that there are certain situations where Alice doesn't work quite as well as, as perhaps it should, because we haven't managed to collect data in that sort of situation before, they could contribute some data to us, or they could at least alert us and we could go and collect some data in that sort of situation. Um, and that's also kind of a, a very, it's a very different paradigm to, to more traditional techniques. Um, where that sort of thing really isn't possible. Okay, to, to kind of draw the uh, conversation towards the close, I just want to end um, on one discussion around um, the, the actual underlying hardware of Alice uh, and how um, you know it's significantly different um, to, to some of um, the traditional consumer camera hardware that, that that's out there. 
and how uh, our hardware is very much a, a unique selling point of Alice. Not only is the, um, the way in which we are undergoing this um, color correction, uh, white balance and exposure uh, correction, rebalancing, uh, uh, unique in terms of its uh, the paradigm in, in, in the way we think about the, the methods that we're using. Uh, but the reason we are using these methods is because we have uh, AI hardware accelerators on device uh, that very much enable this way of doing uh, the, these techniques um, and, and is optimal uh, for, for these ways of doing these techniques. Uh, and so maybe a couple of words on uh, the TPU and, and um, the AI accelerators that we have on device and why these chips are very good at, at doing this type of uh, technique uh, and how that's a differentiator to traditional cameras. So yeah, we've talked a lot about the advantages of AI algorithms and deep neural networks, um, but they do have a major disadvantage, which is that they are extremely computation intensive. Um, it requires a huge amount of multiplications and additions and mathematical operations to perform a neural network. Um, <clears throat> and um, actually to do those on a small device, battery powered device, where you're very constrained by the amount of power that you can use, the amount of heat that you can produce, um, is, is, is very difficult. And until fairly recently, it has not really been possible. Um, but there is, uh, in the last few years, new hardware has become available designed very specifically for this task. Um, and we are using some of that hardware. We're using the Edge TPU, Tensor Processing Unit, uh, as Vish mentioned. And this is basically a, a small chip which is designed exclusively for performing these deep convolutional neural networks in a very low power optimized way. Um, so it can it is capable of performing four tera operations per second. Uh, which is a very, very large number of multiplications and additions. Um, it can only be used in a very specific way to do to do these neural networks. It cannot be used as a kind of a general mathematical accelerator. It can only do these neural networks, but it can do these neural networks very quickly uh, with very low power. And it actually allows us to run the sorts of neural networks that um, until a year or so ago had only really been possible to run on big cloud servers, on big cloud GPUs, <clears throat> and allows us to run those on, on the device. Um, and this is this is a very new thing. Um, it's this, these, uh, these sorts of accelerators are available in mobile phones. Um, High-end smartphones use them to do computational photography. Um, it's the secret source behind the Google Pixel and the Apple iPhone, at least quite a lot of the, the stuff that the iPhone does as well. Um, and so being able to actually take these this sort of hardware and put it in a professional camera with professional optical system is a, is really exciting um, because it because it opens up all these new techniques that have all of these advantages that we've been talking about. Yeah, awesome. So um, just to make that point completely crystal clear for our users, if you decide to get an Alice camera, you'll be investing in a team that's dedicated uh, to use uh, innovations in computational photography, deep learning, and AI, and, and bring that to consumer cameras. Uh, you'll be, you know, dealing with a piece of kit that is inherently uh, open in, in, in that we don't necessarily want to lock you down or lock you away from fine tuning um, or, 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 or adapting or, um, you know, augmenting your creative process because we'd like to give you kind of access and control to that. Uh, but also we are using kind of some some of the latest innovations in hardware that will enable uh, uh, an entirely new paradigm of, of thinking, but also of application uh, to uh, the digital camera industry. Um, and, you know, we believe very, very strongly that, that the future of digital cameras very much is um, computational photography and artificial intelligence. Uh, and the smartphone companies have done an excellent job of bringing uh, at least some of that technology to smartphone uh, smartphone cameras, uh, but they've you know been very much uh, constrained uh, in terms of uh, their their size and uh, the, the size of the sensor and uh, the ability to ha only have fixed uh, lenses. Whereas we're offering you a professional grade sensor with interchangeable lenses, so you can take advantage of uh, the benefits that 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 brings from a professional optical perspective. Um, what we're trying to do with these uh, conversations in computational photography 
is to have a fairly informal uh, chat as we would do as, as team members on our kind of weekly engineering meeting. Uh, but to give you guys a, a bit of an insider into some of our, our philosophy, uh, some of our thinking, uh, and why we are, you know, we believe that this is the right way forward uh, for the future of digital cameras. Um, and uh, yeah, let you guys in on, on, on the conversation. So expect more of this. Um, we, we've, got, we've got a schedule planned out. Um, next week, uh, we'll probably be discussing uh, electronic image stabilization. Uh, we might do a more deeper dive into auto exposure potentially. Uh, and we want to talk about uh, things like high dynamic range or HDR. We want to talk about uh, LUTs and image enhancement techniques. Uh, we want to talk about more exotic things like super resolution. Uh, and we do want to invite guest speakers to come and have a you know a chat with us uh, and talk about some of these um, uh, these innovative techniques. So uh, please do subscribe. Please do keep an eye out for some new content that we'll be producing. Uh, and with that out of the way, I'd really like to thank Liam uh, and Shelley again for both of your for your time, uh, as well as your insights into uh, discussions around uh, color science. I'm sure there'll be more discussions in the future. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.